opportunities uh, that are around the fintech space uh, in Tunisia and how uh, we can actually be building bridges with the outside world. Uh, very unfortunately, our fourth panelist, uh, Karim Jouini, uh, had a uh, last uh, minute uh, desistement and won't be able to uh, join us today. Uh, I uh, will ask the panelists to, to introduce themselves uh, one, one by one, and then I'll, I'll give a brief overview of the Tunisian ecosystem. We're lucky to have with us today uh, not only Tunisians, uh, but also uh, you know, individuals living outside of Tunisia. And uh, so we just wanted to share with you a little bit on what's happening in the state of affairs of the Tunisian startup ecosystem and the innovation ecosystem focused on fintech. Uh, before we can actually dip, dig uh, deeper with each of the panelists on certain um, you know, certain topics that are related to fintech. Uh, so, uh, Dora, please, uh, we'll start with you. Go ahead. If I can please ask you to unmute your microphone. It's okay now? Perfect, thank you. Great. Thank you, thank you, Yahya, for having me. Thank you for this uh, uh, kind opportunity to talk about uh, fintech and uh, uh, the uh, and to get an overview of the fintech ecosystem in Tunisia. Uh, I'm really very pleased to be part of this panel. Um, so I'm uh, Dora Marek Shirgaig. I'm uh, the head of the uh, regulatory sandbox and the innovation lab at the CBT. Uh, I was working uh, in the governor office since uh, uh, four years, and uh, uh, I'm also uh, I have been charged actually since 2018 uh, to deal with the fintech ecosystem in Tunisia in order to put in place our proper roadmap for Tunisia, and uh, then while uh, interacting with the ecosystem, doing a, a benchmark with other regulators, we have put in place uh, our strategy. Uh, I'm also the representative of the CBT in the, in the regional fintech working group under the ages of the uh, Arab Monetary Fund and the, uh, also the representative at the uh, fintech committee uh, for the Maghreb fintech committee. Thank you very much, uh, Dora. Salma? Uh, thanks again. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, briefly, uh, my background, um, I'm a fintech entrepreneur turned VC investor. I spent uh, most of my career working in emerging markets last 10 years in Africa. Uh, initially, I was in charge of leading growth for M-Pesa, uh, launching M-Pesa in different markets, but also leading product innovation. So worked a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, then I set up a fintech business in London, serving underbanked migrants, remittance business, allowing uh, migrants send money uh, from Europe to Africa, Eastern Europe, Southern Asia, wherever their home is. I sold that in 2017 and then moved to Tunisia. Uh, ever since I refocused on uh, venture capital and mostly in fintech. I've been investing in fintech since 2016. Uh, helping entrepreneur, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs with my advice from my own operational experience in networks. I recently set up uh, an early stage fintech focus fund called Ventures Zero One, which is just uh, set there to continue doing more of what I'm doing so far, which is supporting early stage entrepreneurs, seed stage, pre-seed, pre-series A across Africa. Uh, the focus is on North Africa, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Egypt, but also Kenya and Nigeria, and building bridges between the two regions where a lot of similarities lay. Thank you very much, Anis. Thanks, Yahya. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Anis Khalil. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kaun. Kaun is, fin is a fintech company um, based here in Tunisia, working mostly on um, problems around barriers to entry for the financial sector, for financial services and e-government services, uh, mostly people that are typically underserved or unbanked. Um, we're passionate about the topic. And I, uh, before that, I was actually, um, you know, I went to school in the U.S., saw a little bit of how the setup is done for, for most of the transactions, mostly cashless, got interested in why that's the case and not, not in Tunis, got me 
passionate about reading text of law and, and regulations and what makes a certain uh, economy sort of more open. Um, and, and then obviously looking into the African examples um, in different countries, most notably obviously with Kenyan, uh, the Kenyan example, um, it, it got me interested in the whole region. So I took a job with a Swiss investment firm called Seedstars, traveled around in 2017 to about 16 countries um, to basically go and work on the pipeline of um, investment within the context of a, of a startup, early stage startup competition. And then uh, that led me sort of into the entrepreneur uh, hat. So I started the company with, uh, with a friend of mine, Nebras, here. Um, and since then, it's been three years of um, fun, a fun journey that I, I'm sure we'll get to, to a little bit of an, uh, um, an opportunity to talk about here. But I think it, it speaks to uh, the opportunity that, that exists in the market. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Sedma, who definitely has been a huge help for us in the early days and, and, and until now. Great, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I never thought uh, that uh, passion for texts of law could lead anybody anywhere, but apparently it did lead you to become an entrepreneur. So I'm, I'm happy for, for that. Um, so just a few brief minutes about the, the, the Tunisia startup ecosystem, and I'll let you guys describe the, the FinTech ecosystem. But essentially, um, I think we have about uh, a third to a half of the audience with us today who's, uh, who's not from here. Um, and so, so Tunisia uh, has its particularities. Uh, it's a country that um, until very recently, people didn't necessarily associate with innovation or entrepreneurship or startups. Uh, the, the changes that have been happening over the, the past three to five years have been enormous, both on a regulatory level, uh, and I'm counting on you, Dora, to uh, talk a bit more uh, about that. Uh, but uh, the, the one thing I can mention is that the, the Startup Act uh, is, a, is a law that um, was uh, initiated uh, from the bottom up in Tunisia that actually provided a lot of advantages for, uh, for Tunisian entrepreneurs. And that was actually replicated uh, in several countries across Africa. Uh, definitely one of the, the, the proudest uh, product of the Tunisian ecosystem here, uh, but also in terms of talent. Uh, so I think one of the main particularities of the Tunisian ecosystem is really uh, very bright young entrepreneurs who are uh, fighting to, uh, you know, to, to really uh, kind of go against several challenges uh, in, in order to succeed, in order to grow uh, their businesses and to really make a difference, both economic and social uh, across their environment. Uh, the, on the flip side, uh, so Tunisia is, it, it's a very small country, um, I think 11 million people uh, surrounded by, uh, by very large countries, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Libya. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's actually very close to the European market, uh, relatively close to the MENA market and uh, close to the Sub-Saharan African market as well. Uh, of course, not, in, not, not mentioning the, the Maghreb market all around it. Uh, so it has very high potential, um, but because the, the, you know, the, the country itself has a small market, there's an impetus for entrepreneurs to go out of the country very quickly. And that's, uh, that's one thing that, uh, you know, I will ask you, Anis, to, uh, to talk about a little bit. Um, and uh, these days, because of the globalization of VC investments, things are becoming more and more uh, competitive across, across the emerging market world. And Selma, that's where I'll, I'll draw on you and your own experience to really compare the opportunities that uh, you have as an investor in Tunisia compared to other countries. Uh, and so men mentioning Nigeria, uh, Kenya, Egypt. Uh, and so, and so that's, that's where I think it gets quite interesting because there's a lot of pros and cons. Um, finally, the, the FinTech ecosystem in particular is, is quite interesting in, um, in Tunisia because compared to the growth of its overall ecosystem, it's actually been quite slow. There's many reasons for that. And I think we, can, we will definitely get into them. Um, but even if we just take the Flatix Labs portfolios, so uh, for those who don't know, Flatix Labs is a startup accelerator and a VC fund uh, that has a presence across uh, seven countries uh, in the MENA region. And so in Tunisia, where we've been active uh, for the past three years and, uh, and manage a 30 million dinar fund, 
um, we our fintech portfolio is very small. I believe um, I think we we have less than ten percent of our portfolio that's fintech compared to forty percent on average of our portfolio across the other locations that is fintech. And so clearly, there's a very big discrepancy in terms of the incidence of fintech. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the questions I would like to ask you guys today is, is why and, um, you know, and what can we do to remedy that? Um, so I'll start with my first question to, to Anis. So we'll start with the challenges uh, for Tunisian fintech entrepreneurs. Uh, so you've, you've had, you know, I think you've, you were able to, to actually join, uh, you know, a startup support entity before starting your, your own uh, startup. And so in a way, you also had a bit of an overview or preview of the challenges you were about to face, uh, which, which really you know, brings me to my first question, which was, you know, you just recently launched your, your in, in a very uh, big mediatized way, really good on you, uh, your, your product, Flucy Wallets. So what were your, the biggest challenges that you had from the moment of starting or initiating and, and developing your product all the way to launching it, uh, I think a month or two ago, Anis? Yeah, no, that, so that, that, that's, uh, that definitely sums it up. If you want to simplify it is we've been working on this for exactly three years. We've only launched the product a couple months ago. And I think that, that goes to obviously uh, the complexity of, of, a, of a, a sector like fintech and working in fintech is obviously overly regulated in, in general. But in Tunis, I think because the market is still very nascent and because a lot of things are changing, uh, it's been overly complicated for a startup like us to, to, to find its play, a place and navigate the complexity of the regulations uh, to, to actually make this happen. So Dura knows me very well because we met in early 2018 when, uh, when basically what we did is um, we saw that there are a lot of barriers to entry and a lot of them are uh, based on the regulations and what startups are allowed to operate and to do. Um, so we kind of came up with a technical infrastructure and architecture that takes into account the complexity of the regulation and doesn't ask for a regulatory change, but rather just to validate what's already um, in place with a different maybe interpretation of the current law. Um, and we presented this to the central bank. Um, this was the February 2018. We were actually very uh, well received. We met a few committees. And then the conclusion of that meeting or series of meetings was we like what you do. We think what you do is not really against any regulations, but there's actually no way for us to give you any official papers or any authorizations because there's no official relationship between the central bank and any startup of any kind. Um, so I think the, 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 that kind of put um, a bit of a delay in the whole process because we had to basically look for a commercial bank partner, uh, reorganize sort of the value proposition around that and, and, and look for the best way of the quickest way to be able to deliver our value added um, within the ecosystem with the current laws in place. Um, obviously, since then, there's a lot of laws that are in the works um, around payment, payment establishments, around um, the, the fintech regulatory uh, sandbox that maybe uh, Dura can, can elaborate on. So there are a lot of initiatives in the works, but obviously, these things take time, um, and for for a startup, you know, two or three years is not um, a, 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 an amount of money that you can easily um, expect expect to wait uh, and 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 sort of work around. So a lot of startups pivot or find more of a B two B approach rather than a B two C, just to make sure that they can get paid. The bottleneck of um, obviously of payments is, I think, the inflection point of the, of the Tunisian market sort of booming and letting other industries develop. So it's a huge issue uh, besides the, the, the payment itself. Um, but I think there's also an inherent advantage to sort of the traditional players um, getting the benefit of the doubt and being able to launch things faster or get the proper authorization faster. Um, and, and sort of the risk averse nature of the Tunisian society manifested itself in, in the administrative tasks and how long things uh, take for decisions to be, to be taken. Uh, sort of the tendency to go to a down, like a top down approach where one solution should be adopted by, by a lot of people in the ecosystem. Um, and I think that because everything is based on authorizations um, we tend to look for regulation before we look for uh, a, 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 like a space of freedom where we can we can test things out, and that's I think what the sandbox is is designed to to, to fix. 
Um, but but definitely the complexity of the regulations has been has been the biggest thing, and a lot of notions around what's accept acceptable to do and what's not hasn't been sort of black and white. It's always a gray area, uh, which requests a lot of time for different committees to look into it to give you a proper authorization. And when we we put a startup between a regulator and the commercial bank or a partner with a financial institution the chain sort of takes longer than than what's ideal for for a startup that wants to test its market and validate its concept um, there are a few other things that here and there sort of around for example personal data protection laws that easily drive uh, the fees up for for cost of, of of operations for a startup so not being able to host any personal data Outside of Tunisia means you have to get Tunisian servers, which cost easily 10x what uh, a server's cost um, when when it comes to the normal cloud providers that we all are familiar with. Um, the, so this is all of the regulatory side, and I think I'm not going to dwell too much on it because it's definitely going in the right direction when it comes to the recent changes. Uh, the market itself definitely also isn't 100% ready. Um, not when it comes to just um, basically people's willingness to try new things, uh, people's sort of habit changes, their, their um, ability to, to look at cashless transactions as equivalent to, to cash and all of that is, is, is definitely a challenge. But beyond that, I think um, there's, there's a, an issue with infrastructure that's in place, right? Uh, a transfer of money through the traditional methods isn't ideal. It takes time, it's overly complex. It, it uses really old sort of uh, tech, um, but also at the same time, most of the banks don't have the proper infrastructure. Um, their systems aren't up to date. They don't have APIs that facilitate integrations with third parties like startups. So a lot of it has been wanting to do one thing and finding a lot of missing pieces of the puzzle. So you have a choice to either wait for the market to be ready or to basically what Selma always tells me overbuilt just to fix a lot of issues that traditionally aren't really yours to fix. Um, and I think that's a choice. Um, and that definitely when it comes to the international uh, scope of things can put you um, at a disadvantage because you're having to solve so many issues and, and, and that goes against the traditional startup approach. But I think it's definitely a, a balance that you have to find and there's some strategic decisions that you have to make as a, so, as so a Anit, company. If you don't mind me asking you to maybe dig a bit deeper on one particular issue, which I think is affecting so much more than just fintech startups, which is the payment issue. I mean, like, like you said, and I think so, you know, we've, We've invested in 50 startups here, and I think every single one of them has uh, payment issues. So can you just describe a little bit more, you know, what is that issue? Um, and also how Flusi helps resolve that issue. Uh, and just a small reminder to our audience that you can actually, uh, you know, leave questions at the, at the bottom. I think there's a Q&A button at the, the bottom of Zoom. Uh, that actually allows us to uh, to read the questions. It allows the panelists to also read questions as well. Uh, that will you know, and we'll hopefully try to get to all the the questions. There's already a few questions in there. It would be great to actually have a few more as well. Uh, Anis, go ahead. Yeah. So um, going back to the the pay, so the issue is that most startups or companies in general, regardless of what industry they operate in, have to have basically a few people to an, enti an entire department just dealing with payments. That's because mostly cash is king. Uh, about 90% of, of, of uh, sort of uh, the, 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 the transactions that happen um, are cash withdrawals when it comes to, to basically the banking operations. Only 36% of Tunisians are banked. So most of the people are excluded and, and by design from the, the financial sector. Um, a lot of the operations take a lot of time. They're not convenient. There's only basically one, um, one provider for, for most of the services, which means that fees aren't necessarily driven down by competition, but rather uh, by either strategic pressure or political will. Um, and, and, and that also affects sort of the, the variety of services that can exist in a market uh, for niche types of industries and what people are looking for. I think there's not one solution that fits all and uh, not having enough players definitely put, put a challenge on that. As an example, there's only one, um, one, one basically company that 
uh, executes all of the card transactions for all banks in, in the country, which you can, you can think of the potential risk that comes with that when it, when it comes to um, downtime at a specific time or a, a, an influx uh, or an increase in, in, in the volume of transactions or the number of transactions which happened during COVID uh, and resulted in, in some issues. Uh, so I think the, the problem is inherently around um, how can we have more and more players specializing in different types of industries uh, or providing value added services beyond the transfer of money because the transfer of money isn't really uh, the, the goal itself, it's a means to an end. So what we decided is, is the best course of action is to actually use the transfer of money as, as one pipeline towards a variety of added value services. And that's why we had an, an, an EKYC component that allows not un, unbanked people to open bank accounts without going to the bank. So the fact that people mostly have smartphones, have internet uh, connection, but aren't banked, that's an easy uh, way to sort of include people by giving them a free offering where they open a free bank account get access to the service and only pay if they see a value in, in, in what they get uh, out of the solutions. So this is what Flusi's tried to do. In terms of infrastructure, like I said, a, a transfer of money can take up to three days to be executed. And this is sort of a standard even internationally. So we wanted to really push um, the, 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 the imagination of what could be done by uh, providing like a, a blockchain infrastructure that represents the partner banks and allows people from different banks to uh, send money instantly to each other in, in cycles of four seconds. So you can think of uh, driving down not only the cost, but also the time um, and using those two modules of ident identity, digital identity and uh, instant payments, you can build a lot of other value added services that can drive the change of behavior. We, we believe transfers of money are only you know, the very basic things that everybody should have, but there's a lot of things around access to finance uh, and, and sort of uh, providing the right service to the right clients at the right time that would be really beneficial for the ecosystem and could serve a lot of uh, startups or normal enterprises to, to grow and not worry too much about handling cash and cash on delivery issues and the risks that comes with that uh, as well. Great, thanks. Um... Thanks a lot, Anis. So I would like to address uh, Selma, the entrepreneur. Um, and uh, so, so you know, you have a, you, you've had quite a bit of an experience uh, with multiple startups in the fintech sector. You've, you know, you've been here for three, four years now. Uh, how would you see the challenges? So, so forget about your investment side for now, but how do you see your challenges as an entrepreneur? Um, how do you see the challenge of a Tunisian entrepreneur uh, in addition to anything that Anis may have mentioned, you know, knowing now or better knowing now the Tunisian regulatory, but also the Tunisian operational and Tunisian market uh, based uh, constraints or restrictions? Yeah, I think, I think my entrepreneurial journey would have been uh, 10 times harder if I was building the business here <laughs> than what I, when I did it in London. So really kudos to all the entrepreneurs here, uh, big respect. Uh, on, honestly, I, I think if um, I will illustrate perhaps some of the challenges there, you know, on, on my journey, when, when I what the business I was building, it was, um, it was a remittance business for which I had to apply for a payment license, a type of a payment license with the FCA. FCA is a financial contact authority of the UK, uh, which is one of the most progressive regulators in the world, which makes London the fintech capital in the world. <laughs> so uh, uh, the FCA approach uh, has been to learn, engage, and then regulate. And one important thing there is when I applied for a license and I had a you know, minimum viable product and I was launching it, I got a payment license that it took me six weeks to get and costed me 7,000 euros. And I had no capital requirements to launch. However, that meant that I was capped. My activity was capped at about 300,000 euros um, a volume of volumes uh, a month. Yeah, so once I surpassed that volume, which was perfectly enough then for me to launch, test the product, 
learn, improve the product, build my operations, make it all you know, work better, improve, uh, you know, uh, do, do the next version, et cetera, et cetera. And then once I reached that threshold, yeah, I had an obligation to upgrade my license, which then came with uh, more requirements on security, customer, um, customer funds, safeguarding, which is a very important thing. If a fraud happens, money cannot be lost and things like that. But capital requirements that came with it were proportionate to the volume that I was processing. So uh, really, this is a clear example of a risk-based approach. Let's not put capital requirements, let's open the market to those to come, improve the way banks work, improve the ways customers and SMEs can access finance by letting them launch and regulating them proportionately to the size of the risk they present, which is directly on volumes. So this was a uh, this is this is I think a very um, um, very illustrative example. So working with entrepreneur, entrepreneurs here, I, I think I think uh, really this is this is uh, this is the I, I know that regulation is going in the right direction, so that's great. But it's just an illustration or where we should you know where we should get a uh, risk based approach. Uh, on on everything, I, I think also I can mention what happened in Kenya. You know, with M-Pesa, this was 2007 when M-Pesa was launched. Central Bank of Kenya is not the most, you know, was not the most advanced regulator in the world, but they chose um, not to forbid but to oversee closely. And uh, once M-Pesa scaled, you know, and the telco uh, Safaricom had to go there and report on a regular basis. They came up with a regulation which was revolutionary at the time. And particularly, there are three elements of that regulation that uh, are the key ingredients uh, that allowed MPESA as innovation to, to happen. Number one was the risk-based approach on capital requirements, as I, as, I, as I just explained. Second, they democratized the distribution of money. It meant that we are, you know, in emerging market in Tunisia, like everywhere, we are here to replace cash because cash is inefficient. Uh, cash, we don't have track of it. It's in the regulator's interest to see where cash moves. If there's no trace of that, how can regulator take control of the finances in the country? What about money, anti-money laundering? Uh, what about you know, uh, different, different terrorist financing? You name it. What about uh, tax liabilities, uh, et cetera? So it's in the regulator's interest to digitize the cash that it's moving in the country. So what they did is that they allowed an exchange between cash and electronic money to happen at any type of shop. It was not tied to the bank branches anymore. They democratized it. They said, any agent can become an any any person can become a registered agent and start uh, exchanging become an exchanger of electronic and cash electronic money and cash and so at the end we had like people who would go register with safaricom buy electronic money for whatever working capital they have put a carton box in the middle of a road an umbrella, get a phone, and start exchanging, and and you know this became so, um, and it became everywhere. It, it became so widespread that then it was easy for people to exchange electronic uh, cash for electronic and vice versa, and they started using the service. Third piece of regulation, that uh, third element, a key ingredient, uh, was. Uh, the fact that uh, the regular Kenya Central Bank of Kenya allowed uh, remote KYC. So as a, you know, to provide financial services uh, for the audience, everybody needs to, has an obligation to register its customers and to verify their identity. Now, in the majority of the countries in, in Africa, it's still needed to do that in person and they have to go to the branch and present documents. And now registering them remotely and allowing that really, really eases the onboarding of new customers. So what Kenya, as Kenya did is that they allowed anybody to register and start transacting, but uh, uh, registering via phone. But again, capping that based on on the, on about like seven hundred dollars, um, uh, you know, value of transaction per per month. 
So as long as they stay within this limit, which were the needs of majority of the population, they didn't need to go to the branch or upload additional documents. So I think you know this is really uh, what an enabling regulatory environment should provide. Uh, and then, of course, I think a key ingredient, I, I think a third, uh, apart from the regulation, I think a very difficult thing that uh, Tunisian fintech entrepreneurs are facing is, is lack of uh, appetite uh, from incumbents to step into partnerships. We need a real push, uh, you know, from, from everywhere. <laughs> so that banks and others can embrace the power of technology and partner with, with startups and say, I am regulated entity, I have certain things to bring in this picture, but you have the technology, you have the innovation, let's work together to provide better value to our customers and to address the unaddressed parts of the population. Voila. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And there's a lot of uh, you know interesting points that uh, we'll uh, come back to in a bit. Um, Dora, I want to uh, to switch uh, to to you uh, for uh, for a little while. So um, you know, Dora, I think you've you, you've been uh, one of the the best friends of startups within the the central bank for many years now. Um, extremely approachable. We're very lucky to have you with us in the ecosystem. And on this panel as well, um, and uh, you know, I think you've you've done a lot of work uh, on not only um, looking at what's happening in Tunisia, but also on what's happening abroad uh, and how you can actually you know uh, filter in or maybe adapt some of the some of the best the uh, best practices that were uh, that have been initiated abroad and actually put here. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the work that uh, you've been doing at the central bank, uh, particularly, uh, you know, related to uh, the, the legal framework, how it has changed uh, over the, the past few years, uh, maybe a bit more detail on the sandbox itself, because that's, you know, I think, the, your, your newest project, and I think a very exciting project that could actually help uh, many entrepreneurs uh, like, uh, like Anis. So can you please tell us a bit more about what's, what's happening, what are the efforts that have been done from the central bank um, and how we can, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and then I'll, I'll ask you more questions later. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Yahya, thanks. Um, actually, uh, maybe uh, I will start uh, as you have uh, asked it by uh, uh, giving a brief overview on the uh, legal framework and the regulatory framework governing the fintech activities in Tunisia. But uh, uh, maybe uh, before that, I just want to, uh, to mention that uh, the strategy of the CBT to foster innovation in the uh, financial sector was elaborated, uh, as you have been uh, saying, and Anis also mentioned that, in collaboration with the fintech ecosystem, with all stakeholders. Since 2018, we were working very closely with the ecosystem in order to well understand the needs of the market, uh, the barriers they are and the challenges they are facing and uh, the potential uh, actors in order to help them and in order also to put the, the right response to the need to the, of the market. So um, we have work, uh, been working on the uh, local ecosystem by examining the need, but also we have been interacting very well with other regulators uh, through the world. So we have uh, been interacting with the most advanced one. We have uh, organized very uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, study visits, so we are uh, interacting actively with other regulators, the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, the La Banque de France, uh, uh, Bahrain, uh, and also um, as a representative of the CBT on the Regional FinTech Working Group, it's a great opportunity to deal with other regulators to see what are what they are doing and what are the trends to to foster innovation in the financial sector since it's a global issue today for a global opportunity but also a global issue for us as a regulator. So we are dealing closely with uh, with uh, with them. 
And uh, we have uh, been working on benchmarking the best practices, the different tools to, uh, to uh, promote innovation, since there are many ways to, uh, to uh, help to foster innovation in each uh, uh, ecosystem, and basic on the needs of the Tunisian fintech ecosystem. And we have opted for some uh, initiatives uh, pi piloted today by the uh, unit of the uh, innovation and the fintech, which is a dedicated unit put it in place in the Central Bank of Tunisia. So uh, maybe at first I will uh, share with you some uh, highlights and some uh, figures uh, based on a very recent report that we were uh, working on jointly with uh, PwC and the World Bank on the fintech uh, ecosystem in Tunisia. Uh, uh, today, uh, we, uh, we have identified actually more than 70 fintech active in Tunisia. They are mainly um, active in payments and transactions. Uh, concerning the technologies uh, used by those fintechs, so 30% of the technologies are uh, mainly um, uh, of fintech are mainly using uh, blockchain. 26% uh, are opting for artificial intelligence and 21% for cryptocurrency technologies. Uh, also, the studies uh, shows that 67% uh, 60, of uh, fintech in Tunisia are uh, labeled. They got the label startup. Uh, for the concerning the maturity, we are talking uh, uh, about uh, uh, an early, sta early stage fintech, since 50% uh, of fintech consider that the project phase actually is at a, a launch level. So it's not, uh, they're not all uh, very uh, mature, but we have some licorns uh, who are uh, operating uh, even in Tunisia or uh, abroad. So uh, fintech are active in Tunisia, 40% um, of Tunisian fintech are active in Tunisia, 90% uh, are active in Africa, and 70% are active actually in uh, Europe. Also uh, concerning, uh, actually 80% of uh, fintech have mentioned that uh, the, the products that, that uh, they are offering are governed by legal and existing frameworks. So. Uh, since it, uh, they are mainly about payment and insurance. And the two main uh, risks and threats that, are, uh, that uh, were mentioned by FinTech in Tunisia through this study uh, were the financial risks and legal and non-compliance risks. Uh, and uh, uh, just to share with you and with Enis so, uh, some figures about the main uh, barriers uh, faced by fintech in Tunisia today. So uh, the administrative procedures, 95% of uh, fintech have mentioned this uh, uh, barrier. Uh, the regulatory framework, 94%, uh, 94%, uh, 94% the access to market, 71%, and the access to finding, uh, 70%. So uh, just uh, uh, I wanted to start with some uh, figures because we, we were working on this report in order to get uh, a clear uh, overview about the uh, local ecosystem in Tunisia and how it is uh, moving. So uh, regarding the uh, legal framework, maybe I will um, highlight some uh, uh, some uh, laws or uh, some uh, circulars uh, published by the CBT uh, related to the fintech activity. So uh, at first, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear you very well. Great. So uh, like you have mentioned, uh, actually, uh, Yahya, the Startup Act uh, has been one of the uh, major milestones for the uh, Tunisian startup in uh, ecosystem. So today we have uh, more than uh, 400 startups who got the, their label. And uh, this label actually, it allows them to benefit from several advantages and uh, incentives. Uh, I will mention mainly the, the two uh, incentives uh, related to the circular uh, published by the CBT. So the first one is that the fact that uh, this label will authorize them to get uh, to, uh, to allow them, will allow them actually to uh, open a foreign currency account without any constraints, with, uh, which is a great opportunity for innovators in Tunisia. Uh, the second point is to make payment abroad via the technology card. So, uh, and we were uh, working with uh, 
uh, and interacting with uh, very well with uh, uh, with innovators and fintech while uh, uh, publishing and elaborating those two circulars. Then uh, let's move to the uh, banking regulations. Actually, uh, the the law. 2016-18, published in July uh, 2016, related to banks and uh, financial institutions, uh, have introduced electronic money process as tools for payment minutes. It was for the first time. So that gives actually the possibility for fintech to operate in this field. And then the CBT in 2018 has published the circular on payment regulation, uh, on payment regulation uh, which uh, uh, has, um, has led to the introduction of uh, a new actor in the market, uh, which is the payment institution, and enable uh, them actually to offer uh, payment services at relatively flexible conditions. And it was the first uh, uh, circular pu published by the CBT, which gives the possibility to use innovative technology to open remote accounts. And we are, we are talking here about the uh, digital onboarding, the uh, electronic know your customer process. So uh, to now, uh, four, four uh, operators got their uh, licenses and uh, three others are uh, under examinations with uh, the uh, other department of the CBT. Then there is uh, also the domestic mobile payment uh, circular. Uh, published on uh, May 2020. It's a very recent uh, circular. Uh, it was uh, actually uh, elaborated in order to promote digital uh, payments through the creation of mobile wallets uh, in line, sure, for, uh, with the security and efficiency uh, requirements. So it was uh, published in, uh, in May 2020. And in, uh, the CBT has also contributed actively in the elaboration of the law um, on uh, crowdfunding to uh, elaborate crowdfunding platforms, which, is, uh, uh, which will ease actually the, the access to funds mainly uh, through a non-conventional mechanism. Uh, so the purpose of this law uh, is to provide the necessary financing for projects and companies in order to promote entrepreneurship, to promote investment, creativity, and innovations through uh, three forms of uh, financing. Uh, we are talking about a platform for crowdfunding for investment, credit, uh, or loans, and gifts or donations. So uh, this is just, uh, so, uh, I was just, uh, trying to summarize the legal framework governing the fintech activity in Tunisia. And uh, the CBT, um, based on its uh, role of regulator and its main role, is trying to, uh, to put uh, many ch changes and to, because we are very aware, aware actually of the need to uh, modernize uh, texts related to digital, uh, uh, digital financial and uh, innovation. So we are working, uh, we, ha we have been working on that since uh, uh, 2018. And uh, as you have mentioned, um, despite the, uh, maybe the, all the regulatory uh, measures uh, that were being taken by the CBT, uh, also we were working on uh, other initiatives to boost financial innovation in the sector. So today, Today, with the launch of the regulatory sandbox, which is a very powerful pool, a tool that will help us to, uh, to explore new technology, to, uh, to learn, to, uh, to ensure that all the safeguards are in place in order to, um, to allow those new operators to deploy their solutions. So it's a great opportunity to uh, examine closely those new business models, those new technology, ensure that all safeguards are in place and then put in, pl in place the appropriate uh, legal or regulatory framework. So it's a, a great opportunity to deal with innovators. Great. Um... I mean, so so thank you very much, Dora. So uh, there's a few things actually. As soon as you started talking, uh, a whole bunch of people started uh, sending questions. Um, the first one, if if you don't mind, is 
uh, could uh, the audience have access to the, the report uh, you, you did with the PwC? Uh, is, this a, is this a public report? If yes, if you want, I can, I'm happy to provide my, my contact info and, uh, you know, and I, can, I can share it with them if you want. Actually, uh, it's an internal report, but we will publish it uh, after validation. Uh, we were been working jointly on that with the PwC and the World Bank team. Great. Uh, and actually, when you when you mentioned 70, star 70 fintech startups in, in this report, uh, you know maybe for for the audience who is not uh, from Tunisia may think it's a small number, but I I still remember the report we worked on together two years ago that had 18, one eight uh, startups, yeah. and so the, the growth has actually been substantial over the past 24 months in terms of number of fintechs. Yes, they're still most of them are still early stage, like you mentioned, but that's have, you have to start somewhere, um, and it's actually very, very exciting. Um, the the other question that so for the audience, uh, you know, the the central bank will be able to to publish the PwC report uh, after validation, and and so I think it will probably publish over social media if I'm not mistaken, and probably other channels as well. Um, the other question, and that's you know, let, let let's now kind of look into the future. Uh, we have we have 15 minutes left. Uh, and I'm trying at the same time to incorporate some of the questions from the, the audience directly, um, is that there, there's a question about um, how uh, will the, the central bank continue to take the lead uh, in really making uh, the, the fintech ecosystem in Tunisia a more thriving environment? Uh, and there's two particular uh, questions on the regulatory point and one uh, maybe on, on the more on, on the market, uh, you know, uh, uh, like more of a mark question. The first one for the regulatory is, do you, does the central bank have any plans on the eKYC and uh, on the crypto uh, aspects? Uh, if yes, you know, maybe how uh, was the timeline, etc. I'm sure that these are things that uh, the the central bank has already has already been thinking about for a while. And the second one, and that kind of ties up a little bit with. Um, what Selma was saying about uh, the incumbent um, stakeholders, and so, for example, with with banks. So, what is um, you know, I think a lot of the, the the startups are finding it difficult to to penetrate a market that uh, that that you know I think uh, traditionally has been uh, you know just managed by by banks. What do you see the role of the regulator here to reduce some of the barriers to entry for startups uh, across the board? Thank you, Yahya. Thank you for the question. Actually, let's start with the first question related to EQIC and other regulations. Um, I was actually trying to summarize the uh, most important uh, laws or uh, circulars published, published by the CBT and related uh, directly to the FITEC activity. But uh, actually, we are aware that uh, uh, the existing regulatory framework does not cover all the activities or uh, new business models uh, offered and proposed today by fintech. So we are aware and we are trying to adopt a new way of working. Today in the central bank, we are not working to, uh, to impose or to make uh, circulars um, without collaboration with the ecosystem. So that's why we are opting for uh, an interactive and a proactive approach. It's a proactive approach because we, we want to develop the, regu the regulation in collaboration with fintech. And that's why we have put in place the regulatory sandbox. It's very important today to, to get this uh, regulatory dialogue with uh, innovators in order to well understand and then uh, put in place well tailored and uh, uh, the most efficient regulation uh, to not uh, uh, to not uh, uh, be a, a, a barrier for innovators. Also, it's a great uh, opportunity for us to learn from each other. Today, uh, through the sandbox and uh, other tools that uh, we are working on, uh, it's a great opportunity to work together, to learn from each other. Uh, the fintech uh, need a lot of uh, technical or legal, uh, maybe, uh, assistance and um, we are, we are trying to offer uh, that through the sandbox and also we are trying to understand the technology directly with those innovators. So we, are, we have uh, opted for this new way to get uh, regulations, but smart regulation based on test and learn approach. 
So uh, regarding the, th the four, actually the four uh, candidates that were accepted uh, in the first cohort of the sandbox, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm really delighted to, to have uh, Anis with us. Uh, we have just, uh, we have uh, Kaun with a solution, the EQIC solution proposed by Kaun. The objective of this task is to uh, learn more about the technology used, the business model, uh, be sure that the, all the safeguards are in place, and the objective is to standardize the process. We know very well that there are many other actors that are proposing uh, same solutions, etc., and they need to get the, the uh, appropriate regulatory framework. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, crucial task for us to work closely with uh, Kaun in order to put in place the right uh, regulatory framework related to this uh, to this part of the chain because the uh, digital onboarding is not the uh, is not the goal on, on itself it's just uh, a tool in order to uh, remote and to uh, digitize the uh, onboarding of the client also we are uh, experimenting uh, other new areas and actually i'm very pleased to um, to say maybe that the, the choice of the solutions that were, uh, ac were accepted in the first court of the sandbox shows very well the willingness of the CBT today to explore th those new uh, areas. We have not opted for uh, traditional solutions, payment solution, uh, but we are opting for um, other solutions based on uh, tokenization, uh, crowdfunding platforms, uh, CBDC and digital currency. We have four uh, candidates working on, on those areas, and the objective is to practice those new technology to face the regulatory challenges in order to put in place the right answers. So there are the the main the the four uh, solutions that were accepted in the uh, sandbox for this court. Great, thank you. And so so clearly, I uh, you know it's actually not too far. Uh, from uh, from the the model that uh, Selma was mentioning before, from the the UK regulator, which is the, the learn, engage, and regulate. So essentially, you've you've chosen four initiatives that uh, each represent a specific topic that you would like to actually get to know more about. You'll engage with them, uh, you know, and then it may or or may not actually lead to uh, better or more adapted smart regulations, like you said. Uh, thank thanks a lot. So. So Selma, uh, back back to you. Um, so we don't have a lot of time. We always run uh, out of time on these uh, panels, but I always find it uh, fascinating to to actually listen to the to the experts uh, talk. Um, so Selma, so on more on your uh, investment uh, with your investor hat. Um, you know what what do you feel that Tunisian entrepreneurs need uh, to be able to compete on a on a global level? And so, you know, how, how can you actually, how can we create in Tunisia collectively um, better uh, opportunities for investors uh, and for global investors uh, that, uh, that would actually allow the startups to grow uh, not only within Tunisia, but abroad as well? So maybe I start with what Tunisian entrepreneurs already have. Yeah, so, uh, in the, so what they have and what then they also need to compete on a global level, because we have some stories that have, um, have, have, have been competing on a global level uh, that come out of Tunisia. Um, probably they, they, they bypassed a lot of things because they're incorporated abroad and considered an export company, et cetera, in most cases. But, um, but Tunisia already has some key assets that allow um, local entrepreneurs to compete abroad. Uh, first is the abundance of uh, tech talent, uh, which is present in this country. This is a country of outstanding engineers. Uh, there is a potential, you know, it's, it's a very innovative environment when I compare to other uh, markets in which I invest. I have to say that this is the market where most often I see people inventing things for the first time. So the, the real innovation potential. Second thing is um, this is a this is a nation of people who uh, are uh, naturally have an international and outward looking mentality. Um, it's a country that has strong ties to Europe, uh, has a lot of ties that uh, we, we in MENA region, which can be brought to the next level, uh, and and this is a very important ingredient. Um, and finally, you know, entrepreneurs. 
a lot of the young uh, Tunisian people study abroad and have those networks. And I, I think one, th these are really important ingredients because when we look at Tunisia, if we step back and look at Tunisia versus Egypt, Nigeria, Kenya, and its ecosystem, this is what it makes it stand out. But then when we look at it, I think the one big obstacle to create value in the, in the, VC, ecos in the VC world for Tunisia is, 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 is the size of its market, right? This is an 11 million population. Uh, the expected multiple that any investor may uh, want from its investment in Tunisia is probably going to be much lower about, you know, I don't know, for the same stage, same traction, revenue, number of customers versus Egypt, let's say it would probably be, uh, valuation would be probably be four times less or something like that, right? So, I mean, at, at the stages that I invest. So, um, so, so this is something that Tunisia needs to overcome in order to, and, and, this is, and it, ha, it, it does have the right ingredients to do that. It does have that. So I think this is a big bet. What is missing is I think uh, when it comes to uh, FinTech, as I said, it means it still needs a more enabling regulatory environment. Second, it needs Capital, capital is lacking in this market, but I know that there are some very exciting uh, um, projects on this, which is the fund of funds, which is soon going to catalyze the, 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 the investment uh, ecosystem and, and seed many funds, hopefully, to come. And it needs a more um, open partnership environment. Uh, the, 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 the collaboration between the startups and the incumbents, the corporates and the family offices that play in different industries. I also dream, and I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a thing to watch out for, I dream of a more uh, open uh, collaboration between the central banks in the region. Egypt uh, has started um, its own sandbox a couple of years ago and has made substantial progress, which actually what I found that it actually really accelerated during COVID. Uh, COVID was a big catalyst for, for, for adoption of uh, electronic remote KYC, for example, in Egypt. And I know that in Egypt, uh, there is a much more capital and there is an intense collaboration with the MENA region to actually uh, potentially streamline the direction in which the regulation is evolving, in a, <laughs> which, is a, uh, which can be uh, co which can come as, as a very provocative idea. But if we all want to go in the same direction, why not uh, you know, uh, open some avenues for cross-border collaboration, even in the regulator sector, regulated sectors? This can really uh, unleash the value of Tunisian startups to compete regionally and to become the leaders in the region in the sector. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that this is a great list of, of, uh, you know, of things that need to happen for the ingredients to, to really blend together. Um, we have two minutes left. So, Anis, I'll ask you a question. Uh, I would like, if possible, to be as bullet point structured as possible. Um, we've had actually a lot of questions from entrepreneurs uh, who are uh, in the audience who, um, you know, who keep asking, is it worth launching in Tunisia, given that uh, the, the market is still not 100% there, it's not where it should be, or should we actually try to launch elsewhere? Um, you have 30 seconds. And before that, just a quick announcement, we have a very brief survey. Uh, if you guys, I think it's going to pop up on your on your on your screens. Uh, Whoever uh, is watching on Zoom, uh, if you don't mind taking a, a second to uh, you know to to fill it out. Thanks, Anis. Go ahead. Yeah, and no, I think I think uh, as Tunisians and, and as people in the region in general, I think we, we we thrive in chaos. So any problems are actually interesting and fascinating because there's an opportunity to, to do something new and, and sort of change things. I think just to go back, I scroll through a lot of the comments around how can we get more people to, to actually be competing and, and, and challenge the, the existing players and, and whatnot. I think part of that is, uh, like Mehdi said, uh, going into open banking, open regulation, more of a protocols of exchange of data so that the customer is king and decides where to take his business 
and doesn't feel left hostage when it comes to the type of services that are offered to them. I think that's always nice. I think as a startups, we have the responsibility to actually push that. Um, we definitely have a, a central bank that's willing to listen, that's willing to, 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 to take suggestions. Um, Dura has received a lot of benchmarking and, and ideas from our side uh, for the past three years around what we think is good. And, and all of that is, is definitely necessary because the ecosystem can accelerate the growth uh, uh, and, and the direction in which the regulation can, can be. Obviously, there's a long, long way to get to a truly open uh, ecosystem with freedom to innovate because currently it's always a challenge. Uh, I'm not going to make a judgment on whether it's worth it or not for new uh, entrepreneurs. That's a personal decision. All I'm going to say is that since the revolution, we lost 100,000 people uh, with diplomas that left Tunisia and, and went and uh, into Europe and, and other countries. So if you feel like you might be able to pull this off, definitely give it a shot. There's a lot of incentives from the government put in place that might not be here five years from now. So might as well take, uh, take advantage of the Startup Act. Um, the salary that the government gives you just to develop your idea for a year, um, the tax incentives, the foreign currency account, that's a huge relief. Uh, a lot of things that we definitely know that they're not enough, but they're definitely in the right direction. And, and what, what we're here for is to actually accelerate the missing things and, and build the missing pieces uh, and look more into solutions rather than complaining. Um, it's kind of the only way to survive in, in, in this environment, but it's also, um, if you look at it in an optimal way, and this is definitely a positive year, I hope for everybody, then might as well give it a shot and, and, and the ecosystem is here to support you in any way they can. Absolutely. And so speaking of, of support, if I can kind of structure uh, all, the, all the questions that are uh, still pending, and I'm very sorry for our audience uh, that we didn't have time to address them all. I see them in basically three different buckets. The first one is a request for data. So a lot of people would actually like to, to get access to data. Um, my response is as Flatix Labs, you know, please send us an email. Uh, we have, um, you know, whatever data that we have access to, we'd be happy to, to share. Like Annie said, you know, it's an ecosystem that actually helps to, to support and especially helps to attract both talent, startups and investors and good ideas and innovations to the country. Um, so send us an email at uh, info at flatsixlabs.com uh, and we'd be happy to, uh, you know, to, to help you get that, that data. Um, the, the second one was a lot of questions from non-Tunisian entrepreneurs and asking what, whether those, um, uh, you know, this, this regulatory framework works for them or not. I, I, if, I, if you don't mind that, I can answer. I mean, in some cases it does, in some cases it doesn't. Again, uh, you know, uh, please do send us a, a message or an email, and we'd be happy to actually give you more details. We've, uh, you know, we, we've dealt with several uh, foreign startups, startups that are locally registered, but with foreign entrepreneurs or foreign founders. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we, we kind of know how, how it works here. Um, finally, um, there, there are a lot of questions for uh, the, the regulator about you know, the, the timeline of, uh, of the laws and, and the difference between when the law is actually enacted and uh, when it actually gets put in place, um, you know, Dora, if I can uh, suggest, and I know it's very difficult, but maybe to, to find a way to communicate to the general public, you know, what are the potential timelines for, you know, either either upcoming laws or laws that have already been enacted and uh, that are, you know are, that may be being put into place or, or in process of being put into place, uh, because I think people uh, see that as a uh, you know as a, as a pretty important milestone. Um, but that's it for us. Uh, thank you all very, very much uh, for your time today. Thank you for the audience to, uh, to have been there with us today. Um, uh, thank you to the Flask Labs team who has actually made, uh, made this possible. Uh, really, really appreciate the, the time. And I think it's, it, was, it was very enlightening. I mean, I, I live and breathe in this ecosystem and I love to take sometimes, you know, just a bit of time off to, to be able to discuss with people who are you know, truly experts on, at, uh, at a certain industry and to, to see where they came from and where we're going collectively as an ecosystem. Thank you all again very, very much. And thanks for the audience and uh, take care and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.